Well, hello everybody, Mike here again, and I wanted to start off this video with one very straightforward statement, and that is what you're about to see here in this review is good for everybody. I don't care if you're on Team Blue or Team, actually, what is AMD nowadays? Are they Team Red? Are they Team Green? Are they Team Orange? Anyways, let, let's just call them Team Ryzen for now. Competition is back, baby. We've got two high-end processors, the 13900K from Intel and 7950X from AMD that are releasing within weeks of one another, have identical thread count, and their price, well, that's almost identical too. They represent the best of the best from two companies that haven't been this close to one another at the same time in terms of specs and claimed performance since, well, probably back before Phenom. Before this, it was just simply one company or the other leapfrogging the other one over and over and over again. But what makes this so exciting is that it brings true competition back to the market. And first and foremost, it helps keep those prices in check. And if you want to know a whole lot more about the architectures, the features and whatnot, I'm going to drop a link sort of like right up here because Eber did an excellent, excellent overview about all things you need to know about Raptor Lake other than the actual performance. So the other thing that I wanted to tackle in this part of the video is just about platform costs. And I know that anybody who's buying a $600 CPU might want the best of the best motherboard, but there is a serious story here too that we need to talk about. That's because AMD users might have grown used to simply dropping new processors into existing motherboards, but that stopped with the 7000 series. Now you're tied to a new motherboard and DDR5 memory too. Those boards aren't cheap either. X670 starts, yes starts, just north of 250 bucks, with most running you a cool 300 to 350 $50 US and you don't even want to know what that's going to cost you in Canadian. Even a basic bargain basement B650 board will put you back $170. Want one that's a bit less stripped down? That'll be $200 to $250, thank you very much. Intel's 13th gen, on the other hand, has the benefit of being backwards compatible with Z690 and B660 boards, and that brings down the cost a hell of a lot more. I mean, since Intel launched their Z790 boards, some amazing, amazing Z690 motherboards have come way, way down in price to the point where they're about equal to the average AMD B650. Not only that, but you also have to remember that Raptor Lake technically supports DDR4 memory as well. And there's a ton of motherboards out there that have that support. So that brings upgrade costs down even further. But I do want to mention Z790 because in my opinion, it is completely pointless, overpriced, and lacks any worthwhile features compared to Z690. I mean, look at these things compared to one another. It's just a BS way for Intel to pat their motherboard partners on the back and pad their pockets a bit more too. Okay, with that little rant out of the way, let's get into a little bit more serious things with power consumption because if you listen to any of the rumors that were out there before this launch, they were saying that Raptor Lake, it just guzzled back power like a freaking drunken sailor. But is that the case? Well, the 13900K is the most power hungry processor here under a full core load. Compared to the 12900K, that's a 35 watt increase. On the flip side, Intel still loses to AMD when it comes to overall efficiency, but things really get turned on their head when we factor gaming into the equation. Intel's power and efficiency core setup leads to the 13900K suddenly sipping down less power than the 7950X. So before you call this thing power hungry, make sure you understand the full picture guys, because input power all depends on specific scenarios. All right, so let's move on to temperatures because if you remember, when it came to the Ryzen 7000 series, that was the single most controversial topic of that entire launch. I actually did a full video covering all sorts of topics about temperatures, clock speeds, and what kind of temperatures you can expect from different type of cooling solutions for the Ryzen 7000 series. You can find that sort of like right up here. And it ended up being that there was a lot less to be concerned about than you might have first imagined. The new Tower 500 by Thermaltake is probably the strangest looking mid-tower you might confuse with a 3D printer or a tiny vending machine, but have no fear. The triple glass sides reveal all the goodies inside. The front I.O. is plenty full for all your needs. And so is the interior with support for 360 radiators, massive vertically mounted GPUs and the bottom chamber for the cool fan eyes and the dynamic LCD panel on either side. 
The Tower 500, it's unconventional, but cool. Check it out below. Anyways, I went into testing Raptor Lake with a single question. Can an air cooler like the Deepcool AK620 keep the 13900K under its maximum allowable temperature of 100 degrees? So with the fans running at half speed, the 13900K is kept right, right below its throttle temperature. And that's actually better than the 12900K. On the other hand, the 7950X, well, that's smashed right into its maximum allowable TJ Maxx of 95 degrees. Turn the fans to full speed and temperatures do get reduced by a bit. I mean, sure, you don't want to be running at 94 degrees all day, every day, but at least you don't need a 360 millimeter AIO to keep this thing from throttling. Switching to gaming, and this might be the most interesting thing in this whole video, because even with the AK620's fans running at just 50%, temperatures stick to well under 60 degrees. That's actually three degrees cooler than the 12900K and turn those fans to 100% and it shaves off another five degrees. Meanwhile, if you look at the 7950X, it's a good 17 degrees. I repeat that again, 17 degrees hotter, even though it's consuming about the same amount of power here. So now that we know how this thing actually behaves once inside of a system, let's switch gears a little bit and get on to performance because Intel, they've got some very, very big shoes to fill here. Basically, they have to catch up now with the 7950X, and let's see if that actually happens. Starting with Cinebench, and there's barely anything separating the two top-end processors. All things considered, they perform identically. What you also need to look at is how much Intel's improved in just one generation over Alder Lake. The increase is just massive, but while the 13900K and 7950X did perform almost identically in multi-core results, single-core Intel has about a 10% advantage. The rest of the real world applications show performance that's actually more interesting than if there was a complete blowout here. The Ryzen 9 7950X and i9 13900K perform like they're clones of one another. I mean, sure, sometimes the 7950X squeaks out a win, while in other apps, it's the 13900K with a narrow lead. But overall, they finish even longer, more intensive tasks within seconds of one another. It's almost like someone at Intel or AMD HQ called the other guys up and told them exactly what to do in order to match their competitor's flagship CPU. Personally, what I'm even more impressed with is the 13900K's performance in relation to the 12900K. Remember, Raptor Lake isn't a brand new architecture here. It essentially uses the same foundation as Alder Lake, but adds some key architectural tweaks and frequency bumps. And the end result of between 30 and 40% quicker render times is pretty damn impressive if you ask me. But then there's situations like Resolve, or in other words, applications that have become a lot more dependent on GPU acceleration. So here the difference between processors becomes minimal at Best. And our premier test falls into this category too. But Intel processors do have an advantage here since they're able to further accelerate workloads with their QuickSync engine. So those are our standard benchmark results and they actually posed a few more questions to me than they actually provided answers. That's because these processors are so, so fast. They finish a lot of our regular tests that we have in these reviews in a matter of a few minutes. But what happens if we sort of like flex that out into longer render times in Blender, in Keyshot, and even in Premiere with a VBR2 pass? Well, I was actually expecting a repeat of the last benchmarks, but these longer tests actually tell a different story. That's because the 13900 100K is actually able to open up a pretty good lead in some situations. Its advantage over the 12900K is pretty massive here too. This could be due to better frequency stability on Raptor Lake, or it could be a simple Intel advantage in these apps, since there's some situations like Blender that sees the 13900K and 7950X basically tied again. Well guys, up until this point, what we have here is a statistical tie, a dead heat between the 7950X and the 13900 K. But most of Intel's claims to fame for Raptor Lake and the 13900K lie in a completely different area and not necessarily those real world benchmarks. It's gaming and that's where we're gonna go now starting at 1080p. Overall, it looks like Intel's claims pretty much check out, at least in Valorant. On the other hand, AMD's found some sort of I guess, secret sauce for CSGO. While the 13900K improves over Alder Lake, it still loses to the 7900X and 7950X here. As a matter of fact, the 13900K smashes through what we initially thought was a GPU limitation in some titles. 
It isn't head and shoulders better than what AMD's got, but it does get a bit better frame rates in a few games. That's important to take into account as graphics cards get faster and faster. Something like this processor will have a bit more room to grow as time goes on. But there are still a bunch of games that run into a GPU bottleneck at 1080p, even with an ultra high-end GPU. That just goes to show you that in a lot of situations, especially with newer, more demanding games, the CPU sometimes just takes a back seat. Meanwhile, 1440p results show the exact same thing in Valorant, with the 13900K leading, but now it looks like it can also run ahead in CSGO 2. I've got no idea why the Ryzen 7000 series CPUs struggle so much here, especially with their 1% lows. As for the rest of the games, they're pretty much a carbon copy of 1080p. Some games still favor Intel, especially when it comes to those all-important 1% lows, but there's still a few where AMD manages to eke out at least a small lead. But overall, things are a lot tighter here. Why? Because more of the emphasis is simply put on the graphics card itself. This is actually something you really need to take into account if you're shopping around for a high-end CPU. If you expect to play at high resolutions with maximum detail settings, it's usually a lot better idea to maximize your GPU budget rather than plonking down a ton of money on a processor. So like with all of our other reviews, all the benchmarks that you just saw were run by using Intel's preset limits within the 13900K. That means it just sets itself within a given power envelope. But what happens if you actually go beyond that? Because a lot of motherboards that are available on the market right now, if not every single motherboard in the Z690 and Z790 ranges, allows you to simply remove those limits and allow the chip to really, really flex its muscles. A lot of people might actually say that the 7000 series is already doing that straight out of the box. So let's actually see what happens when you just flip that little bio switch and let this thing go balls to the wall. And this is where the fireworks really happen. In an all-core load, power consumption just goes through the roof. The only thing you'll be limited by is a motherboard's ability to provide the chip with enough current and your cooler's ability to suck almost 300 watts of heat away from the chip itself. And speaking of heat, you better be running one hell of a cooling system if you want to run the 13900K like this. Even a 360 millimeter AIO running at 100% fan speed had the chip running around 100 degrees. But what happens when you actually run some benchmarks with the chip behaving like this? Look, it, yes, it runs hot and it consumes an ungodly amount of power, but is it going to actually make a difference in the benchmarks themselves, in some longer renders? In my opinion, the answer is simply no, it isn't worth it whatsoever. While rendering times do decrease, the amount of time saved is actually quite minimal in the grand scheme of things. This just goes to prove that Intel's tuned these processors to run as fast as possible within their power limits. The next step up in performance simply requires a whole lot more juice, and that's something we've seen on the laptop side for a long, long time. And since gaming uses lightly threaded workloads, it isn't power limited like the heavy multi-core workloads we saw in the last few charts. So in this kind of situation, uncorking the 13900K does absolutely positively nothing since single and lightly threaded frequencies don't end up increasing at all. All right, well, I guess it's conclusion time and I'm going to try to make this relatively simple for you guys. For all intents and purposes in multi-core rendering workloads, the 7950X and the 13900K are statistically tied. There's some wins for each one, there's some losses for each one. But if we look at the gaming side of things, where Intel claims that they are quote unquote the best, I do have to say that from what we're seeing here, even with GPU limitations stepping in every now and then, the 13900K does have an advantage in gaming, especially when it comes to 1% lows in a bunch of the titles that we're looking at. The other thing I want to talk about is, of course, platform cost. Now, I know that a lot of you guys who are shopping for a $600 CPU will probably want the best of the best motherboard. The fact that Raptor Lake is still compatible with less expensive and still amazing Z690 motherboards that are available right now, that is going to be to Intel's benefit, simply because right now the AMD platform 
is so expensive. But Intel has a distinct disadvantage too, because unless something drastic changes, this is the end of the line for LGA 1700, since all rumors point towards Meteor Lake requiring a brand new socket once again. AMD on the other hand, has committed to AM5 being around for a hell of a lot longer than that. So I guess you have to ask yourself, are you gonna be happy with Raptor Lake when it comes time for that inevitable system refresh a couple years down the road? At that point, you're gonna need a brand new CPU, you're gonna need a brand new motherboard and maybe even new memory as well. Or do you wanna buy into the AM5 system that gives you that guaranteed, and I'm gonna put in quotations, guaranteed upgrade path for AM5 over the next few years. But either way, it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're going to land on. Right now, me and I'm sure everybody else out there is just excited about the competition that the 13900K and the 7950X brings to the high end table. Because right now, the way I'm looking at it, it bodes really well for what the future holds. So anyways, I am Mike with Hardware Canucks. I hope you enjoyed this content and I will see you in the next one. Take care guys.